All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, those who I haven't met, we have a really uh, diverse crew here this evening. You know, new people and everything. So thank you for coming. This is Cora. My name is Joe Billy. Um, tonight's speaker is the, actually a Cora employee, and uh, his talk is called "Differently Able." And uh, he was here in July for some of the lightning talks that we did. Um, so please welcome Ian. Gale. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> so I am Ian King. I work at Google. Uh, I'm an accessibility tech lead for Google Hangouts. So anything that's Hangouts, which includes mobile, desktop, and some commercial products, I make sure that people can use it even if they can't see the little pretty pictures and can't hear the funny sounds. This has been a very interesting journey. And so I want to share with you some of what I've seen on it. Uh, but from the perspective of our customers, not from our own perspective, because one of the things that I've learned in my time at Google is helping people to understand how differently able people use our product is key to helping them build better products. Because of course the bug you don't write is the cheapest bug of all. So my other hat that I wear is I am a PhD candidate at the University of Washington in the Information School where my work is in the social history, or social meaning of the early computer, particularly around conversational interaction. So coming soon to a dissertation here. You so I want to begin by telling you a little bit about where my biases are in this talk, the things that are inherently built in. So for one thing, for one thing, I can turn this on. There we go. Um, for one thing, I work with the Hangouts product, I've also started working with another real-time communication product called Messenger. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is going to be within that context. So I'm not going to talk about Google Docs. I'm not going to talk about Microsoft Office. Um, but I want to talk about some of the more fundamental themes in uh, working with uh, software for disabled people. And that's pretty universal. Um, so again, mobile platforms, desktop platforms, all across the spectrum, uh, and we try to make sure that they are equally available uh, on any platform that a person chooses to use. So myself, I am normally able to. Uh, hearing, dexterity, uh, vision when I correct it. <laughs> so this is another interesting challenge, but actually I think that it complements well some of the work that we've done with disabled people within Google <coughs> who weigh in on our products and aren't always gentle. <coughs> so I want to talk about, for one thing, we always talk about accessibility, accessible software. So I want to talk about the nature of accessibility. There's actually an interesting history to it. Um, I want to talk about who are disabled people. I uh, had an unpleasant conversation with a developer the other day <coughs> who said, well, it's so few people. We'll talk about that. So I'm going to focus specifically, obviously for this crowd, on information and communication technology. So I want to talk about how disabilities affect how people interact with ICTs. And I'm going to talk about some tools. I'm actually going to demo some tools that people use if they can't see the pretty pictures. And I'm going to talk at the end on how we, as QA engineers, can use this to support the development of better products for everybody. So for, to start with, accessibility we usually think of as well, blind people, right? That's what people immediately think of for a long time. W3C's focus was on people who were visually impaired. Uh, there's been a broader focus on other types of disability, but there are more uh, factors to accessibility than just your physical capabilities. And in fact, historically, where we begin is with the idea of structural accessibility. In other words, can you get the computer and the user in the same room? When there were five of them in the world and each one cost millions of dollars, this was a challenge. So there were a couple of avenues that were pursued in order to create greater structural accessibility. One was time-shared systems so that you could have 100 people talking to one $3 million computer. The other was small systems so that you could have 
one person talking to a $60,000 computer, which doesn't sound all that cheap until you go compare it to $3 million. So structural accessibility was our first challenge, and in fact, this is specifically called out in some of the early literature about operating systems such as Multics, which was one of the uh, first broadly used time-sharing systems. So once we get people in the room with the computer, what do they do with it? How do they make use of it to solve their problems? Because they're not computer scientists. They're engineers and they're chemists and they're physicists. So conceptual accessibility is about presenting computing to individuals in a way that they can consume it and make use of it. So one of the earliest projects that promoted conceptual accessibility was called JOPS, the Johnny Act Open Chops System. Uh, we see this gentleman on the left sitting at a teleprinter, and he is interactively working with the computer on problems. This is one of the first conversational systems in that you didn't just type something and then there's a response and that's it. There was actually context carried between responses so that you could develop an idea through the course of an interaction. Now, over the next 10 years, we saw steady progress until we got to the next point of disruption, which was 1973 with, with the Xerox Alto, where we now had more than textual interfaces, we had graphical interfaces, and therein lies the problem, because if you can't see the graphical interface, you can't use the system. So physical accessibility became a problem because we solved these other two forms of accessibility. So it, it just all has expanded. We, we don't stop thinking about structural accessibility. That's really where we think about the digital divide most of the time. Can people afford a computer? Can they afford broadband? Can they get broadband where they live? So it's still a problem. Conceptual accessibility is still a problem. One of my colleagues works with uh, primarily day workers, Latino day workers, who need to use computers in order to find jobs, in order to get services, and it is not within their cultural experience. None of the metaphors that we present on the computer screen are all that meaningful. So it's interesting listening to her talk about bringing people together in technology. It's not educating these, these poor, ignorant people, and I'm, I'm saying that totally tongue in cheek. It is about bringing people together so that we understand how to create software that works for everybody. Now, accessibility has become social policy. Everybody knows about the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's why we have ramps. That's why we have you know, all of these various things for mobility. There wasn't a lot about ICT because it was 1990. Not everybody was carrying a phone around with them. But in 2010, President Obama signed the Communication Video Accessibility Act. And this directly affects many companies, like mine, that present advanced communication technologies. Because so many people now don't have a traditional landline phone. They are depending upon cellular technology, which more and more means smartphones. Uh, you just cannot buy a dumb phone anymore. Nobody wants to sell them to you. So this becomes an important factor in being able to produce your product. Now that's all well and good, but here's what I think is the most important factor, and that is that accessibility goes to the core of social justice. I mentioned the digital divide. We are at risk of creating yet another digital divide if we do not create software that is accessible to everyone. This isn't optional anymore. You don't get to choose. Everybody needs to use this technology in order to access goods and services and in order to connect with each other. So when it, that developer told me, you know something, there just aren't that many people. I said, I don't care how many people there are. They deserve access. <clears throat> so I want to talk about what it means to have a disability. This is actually a very, very fuzzy term in a sense, because it is relative to normal. What is normal? Normal is what most people are. That's it. There's nothing right or better about being what's considered normal. It's simply about who is at the top of the bell curve here. And at one end, you have people who maybe are extraordinarily able, people with 2010 vision, people with very acute hearing. And then, you slide down the other side of the bell curve, 
and you have people who have limited vision, no vision, hearing issues. I'll talk more about how these issues, how disabilities show up in people. So one of the challenges that is, I don't know, still with us, it's one of those things that's really hard to root out of uh, the societal structure is the idea that disability means there's something wrong with you. And maybe you just aren't as smart as anybody. Um, I think this guy's pretty smart. Stephen Hawking um, has become the world's prominent astrophysicist. He's also a family man. He's lived an incredibly long life with an incredible disability. And we'll talk a little bit more, by the way, about how he gets around. So about 15% of the world's population has what is considered to be a disability. This is the World Health Organization. This is not a small, insignificant number of people. So who are the disabled? Again, I, like I said earlier, it's not just blind people. It's also people with motor and dexterity challenges. So if you can't hold your hands still enough to touch that little button on screen. This is a problem. Hearing challenges, and it's more than just deafness, as I'll show. Cognitive challenges. Some people have dyslexia. They have a very difficult time reading. There are other types of cognitive challenges, there are a number of them, that can make it very difficult for a person to use something that we made that was just so clever. Wasn't that such a clever idea? Well, for somebody who came back from Iraq or Afghanistan, and was 10 feet away from an explosive device, and uh, now uh, you know, has short-term memory issues, uh, patience issues. You know. Cognitive challenges are beginning to look, be looked at much more by W3C over the last couple of years. And then finally, I'm going to hold up to the last revision challenges, because that's what it already starts with, so I'm going to be reverse. <coughs> So let's talk about motor challenges. So here's a list of a bunch of things that can go wrong with people. So there's injury, there's different diseases, and typically people don't have non-disease related issues with dexterity as they age. There are people who are still perfectly dexterous at 80 years old. So there are ways to take a look at this, break this down. Uh, I watched my father-in-law uh, suffer from and die from, uh, from a disease called progressive supranuclear palsy where he gradually lost control of his body over his lifetime. But what's much more useful to us than thinking about diseases or injuries is thinking about how they affect people's ability to use software. The mouse is obviously a very serious issue for somebody with a, 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 a problem with dexterity. I worked with a woman one time who for some reason or another, just every time she tried to focus, her hand would begin to shake. She had to move the mouse very carefully and then press the button from the top. Um, touch targets. We have these tiny little phones and people want to put more and more things on them and they get closer and closer together. And you know something? Not all of us are 20 years old and have little tiny fingertips. <laughs> Keyboard navigation patterns. So for people who don't want to use the mouse, we need to make sure that they can use the keyboard to do everything that you would do with the mouse. Now this goes all the way back to keyboard shortcuts, you know, office products. But when you start looking at more complex interfaces, it's a challenge to make sure that people can move through the interface in a way that makes sense for the application, that makes sense for the user journey through the product. And then there are people who can't use a keyboard at all. And there are ways for them to make use of ICT, such as switch access. And I'll give a demo on that in just a little bit. So hearing problems don't seem to be as prevalent in my experience because we don't use hearing as much for information from the ICT. Um, but still, there are some places where I find that we, um, we try to be clever and we outsmart ourselves. So again, 
there are really three reasons that people have hearing issues. It may be congenital, you're born with it. It may be, be a disease process that takes, takes away your hearing over time. And it may be traumatic. Dude, that was an awesome concert! Yeah, how many of us went through those? Uh, so disabling hearing loss is the term used by World Health Organization. And it affects 360 million people worldwide. 70 million of those people cannot hear at all. 26 million of us went to too many concerts. 25 million people suffer from tinnitus. <coughs> this is where I was going with the idea that it's not all about deafness. So I want to show you a demo uh, that's on a UK website. Let's see if I can get this to work the way I expect. So I've known people who suffered from tinnitus. And sometimes, one gentleman had to carry around noise canceling earphones. Because in a room like this, if all of us were talking, it was a painful experience for him. So imagine if you went through your life, and this was the background music of your day. This is being generated inside your ears. Maybe it is. Now, think about how quickly some of the sounds that the systems generate, little error noises and things like that, can get lost in that. Okay, can you still like me or anything? Yeah. So, the things that I see with hearing are active items that have no visual feedback. So you have a button, you hit the button, nothing happens, you don't know if it's just broken or if that action is not available. And sometimes if you listen very carefully, you'll hear a little thud. Or on Apple devices, I've noticed there's a little bitty tinkling noise way over here in the stereo field. Those drive me nuts. So either end of the spectrum, again, that's where we tend to lose our hearing over time. Um, the other thing is when you find a video that gives you this essential information you need, because of course they don't want to write up anything for you to be able to learn about the product, they give you a help video. If you can't hear it, it's not much help. And it is one of the things that uh, uh, it was kind of interesting working with Google uh, because we do have, Google does have uh, an organization of people that's responsible for making sure that help videos are all captioned. Captioning is a very labor intensive and less expensive process and there's backlog. So sometimes it's a little challenging to get your product into the queue. So let's talk about cognitive challenges next. So again, really the same issues. We see trauma, we see congenital diseases, we see diseases that are required, and we do see aging processes. We do see that in some people, for reasons unknown, as time goes by, they're quite as quick. Maybe that doesn't make as much sense as it used to. And our elderly are the people who are at the greatest risk of being completely cut off from society. And the promise of ICTs is to help them connect if we build the right ICTs. So again, here's a list of conditions. Now it's interesting, I knew about dyslexia, of course, I had a cousin with it. I had never heard of dyscalculia, which is difficulty to math. Um, we all know about Down syndrome, which affects people to various degrees. Uh, usually Down syndrome people do become relatively productive in society, but again, it takes them a little longer to get there. Uh, autism spectrum disorders are becoming very, very uh, broadly discussed these days. Uh, there's a lot of debate on what falls in, it doesn't fall in, but bottom line is we have people mm -hmm. who do have cognitive issues that we need to address in our software. So what are these issues really? What are the things we have to think about? 
memory. If I've got to remember <coughs> a number from one screen to the next, that may be a challenge for me. Sometimes it's problem solving. Sometimes you kind of need to puzzle out just what it is the developer had in mind. And I enter bugs like this saying, no, no, don't try to challenge the user here. That's not our job. <laughs> you know, we're not doing a computer game here. This is like communication technology. Make it easy for them. Um, attention span, various forms of comprehension. Um, just a brief little demo. So we know which numbers are ordered here. You know, we can look at the screen and it's it's pretty obvious. Now how about this one? So that was on the screen for what, a second? I've seen this in actual software interfaces where it flashes some information at you. Um, one of the things that we specifically call out in the analysis system we use at Google uh, is how do you deal with time-dependent displays? So we finally get to visual challenges. But even this isn't as simple as a lot of people think. <laughs> Once again, some people are born with no vision or with low vision. Some people suffer traumatic injury that ruins their vision. Sometimes it's a disease process. And I'll talk about a couple of those because frankly they're a little scary. So there's a difference between being blind and having low vision. The National Federation of the Blind talks about the difference between moderate visual impairment Severe visual impairment, unfortunately, doesn't give a lot of guidance on which is which. Um, but we can talk about the ways in which people have low vision. Now, we hear the term legally blind thrown, out, thrown around all the time. Legally blind means that your vision does not get better than 2200 with correction. Now, some people wonder what, you know, 2200, 2020, we throw that around. 2020 is a game the average. That's most people can see that thing at 20 feet away. And if you can see it at 20 feet away, then your vision is 20-20. If most people have to be 10 feet away and you can see it 20 feet away, now you're 20-10. So 2200 means somebody who can see this from 200 feet away and you can't see it except at 20. Mm -hmm. Now, what's kind of fun when I do my testing of uh, interfaces is if I remove my bifocals, my near vision is 2200. Oh. <laughs> Helpful. <laughs> <clears throat> so I want to talk about the different forms of visual impairment because this is actually a much greater number of people. Uh, in, the, in the world, there are about 36.9 million truly blind people. Uh, low vision persons are 124, 125 million. So here's this little graphic that I actually pulled out of a presentation I did at Google, which is why you see the black bars, because that's the stuff I, I can't tell you unless that I'm going to kill you. Um, so you know, we just have a little basic color pattern here, right? Nice bright colors. One of the most common visual impairments is color blindness. And the most common is red-green color blindness, which is called deuteronomaly. It affects 1 in 20 men. When I gave this lightning talk, um, there were about 20 people in the room, and one man put his hand up and said, yep, it's me. <laughs> now, you can, you can tell that 2 and 3 here are virtually indistinguishable. So if that's the only indicator I have of whether something is on or off, whether something is active or inactive, whether the 10 kilovolt line is powered up or not, this is a big deal. There's another form of red-green color blindness, protonomaly, and to my eye, this is even worse. And again, this is about 1.3% of men. Women sometimes are color blind, but it's very rare because it's widely. But I still see interfaces that people hand to me and, okay, what does that mean? 
Now you'll notice in these though that I can still tell which is which because I have this other form of information. I have a number in that box. So I have parallel affordances to give me information. So if you're going to use color because it's appealing to people who can see it, you can also use things such as shape, shading, or a completely different iconography to ensure that people get the information they need. There is information parity for everyone. Now, cataracts is a progressive illness. Now, my father just had cataract surgery a year and a half ago, and his doctor just said to him one day, you know, Jim, you're, you're looking a little milky in there. I think we need to do something. And my father said, that's why these glasses don't work anymore. <laughs> he just thought he needed new glasses. And so they did the surgery, and he told me, I'm throwing away my glasses. My vision's perfect. Uh, <laughs> so uh, cataracts is actually the leading cause of total blindness in the world. And it is often secondary to poor, uh, uh, poor nutrition, which is why you see it a lot in developing nations. And by the way, the best place in the world to get cataract surgery is India. Because India has such prevalence of cataracts that doctors do more surgeries in a week than American doctors may do in a year. So another uh, condition that's rather scary and rather progressive is diabetic retinopathy. So what happens is when you're diabetic, the blood vessels inside your eye begin to clot up. And you get this sort of graininess across your retina. And unless you catch it very, very early, there is no treatment. The only way to stop it from getting worse is to stop being diabetic, <laughs> is to control one's blood glucose to within the normal range. This scares the crap out of me because I recently learned that I am diabetic. So visual challenges show up in a number of different ways. Contrast ratio. I actually saw this color combination, blue on blue, in our product yesterday. Mm. Some developer didn't quite understand the instruction from the UX people. And the thing that was amazing to me is that apparently he didn't look at it before he just pushed it out. I talked about information and color changes. Non-distinct iconography. You know, if there's, there's one particular icon uh, that I see all over the place on Android that's a triangle that just turns. And you can't really see those edges clearly. It's not very distinct. That's a battle I have yet to uh, if written content is in images rather than text, it's inaccessible to tools such as screen readers. So it's very important that if you use uh, images just because they look good, that somehow you have captioning so that this information, again, you can have information parity for those who cannot see the pretty picture. So I've mentioned a couple times bits of assistive technology. And I want to actually show you how these things work, both because it's very interesting and because I want you to use these when you're designing, when you're testing software. It doesn't take very long. It's low-hanging fruit. And it's going to make whatever product you're working on a thousand times better. So I mentioned Stephen Hawking. And of course, we've all heard about his computer voice that he's had for so long. Well, the way that works is what's called switch access. Now, for Professor Hawking, he has no motion in almost any of his body. He can twitch his cheek. And so there's a little IR sensor on the edge of his glasses that detects that twitch. Now, what does he do with it? Well, it looks like this. Do a little software change here. <clears throat> this is one of the kludiest things I think I've ever done. Okay. So here we have my Android tablet. And I am going to 
blue sheet and back out of this so that we can get the full. <coughs> Sorry about the contrast. Um, so I'm, I'm going to open the Hangouts product, I'm going to look at a message, and you know, maybe I'll write a response. But I'm going to use one finger and one key. So I press a key, and you notice the outline, uh -huh. how it keeps moving? Now this is actually set pretty slow. Somebody who uses this all the time would have this set much faster, because otherwise. So now I click that same switch, and I open the application. I click that switch again, and it begins navigating through the controls of the application again. And it's going to go through all the messages. And see, I'm going to go to my friend's message here. And now that's open. And now, I will walk through the message. And don't put our on me. I love battery saving, but on the other hand, <laughs> There is other information behind a given message, but I want to get down here because I want to show you how I'm going to write a message. <coughs> Go through the rest of the messages on the screen, get down to where I can write a message. Oh, butter, I missed it. All right, well, let's, let's attach a sticker. So stickers are this unbelievably popular thing. I think they're really dorky, but I send them to my daughter all the time because she absolutely loves them. So my friend is going to wonder what I'm smoking. Because huh? I'm going to send him this sticker. So I just, I just sent that image. So I really do want to get this to show you a keyboard because it works very well. Surprising the well. So now, where's my highlight? I've lost it. Come on. You worked right the other day. Oh, there we go. Okay, so after I go through, I still a few bugs in the system. Um, after you go through the rest of the screen, then you get that menu that just popped up so that you can do global things like go back, go home, go to the home screen, you can completely back out of what you're doing. So the kind of meta control that you want to have over an application. So that's the basics of switch access. So that switch can be anything. I'm using one key on a Bluetooth keyboard, but like I said, Professor Hawking has his cheap twitch. There are people who use uh, sip and puff. With, they just use a tube in their mouth. Let me go back to my slides here. <coughs> now, one of the risks of that, because you hit the wrong key, one of the risks of that is that you end up creating an interface that has too much stuff in it. And so if all you can do is sip and puff to move through it, that can get really tiring. And so this takes very thoughtful design. And in fact, when this works correctly, I've never tried it on the Samsung before. Uh, it will actually move row to row within the keyboard. You pick a row, and then it moves across the row, and you pick a, a letter. And as you fill in letters, just as when you do with, with the keyboard, it will give you suggestions. And you can pick the suggestions in the same way. So this actually is surprisingly efficient. So another interesting little Google toy that we have for people with hearing issues, um, video chat is actually very, very popular in the deaf community because they can sign. So instead of just text, they can sign, and the, they tend to be very expressive in their signing. I've, I've talked with several uh, people who are sign language experts, either because they can't hear or because they support people who can't hear. And it is a very expressive language, just as spoken language has inflection. So Google has a feature where you can select an interpreter who shows up for the people who need it. So rather than seeing my talking head, they see the interpreter giving them information that's useful to them. So, low vision enhancements include 
something obvious like large text. Let's make the text on the screen bigger so that I can read it. I you worked on the first Windows phone, and one of the things that drove me nuts is they had this big screen and this itty tiny font for the phone number. I had to pull out my reading glasses in order to tell who was calling me. It drove me nuts. Um, screen zoom allows you to essentially put a big magnifying glass over the screen and pan around to find the controls. It's a lot better than, uh, than zoom text if what you're looking at is a graphically rich interface. Uh, inverted and enhanced color schemes because sometimes visual impairments uh, will affect your ability to see contrast even beyond anything we can do with conventional color schemes. Some of them are very garish, but sometimes amazingly effective for people who otherwise can't read the screen. And the same with enhanced contrast. Uh, Mac is particularly good at this. They've been doing this in their operating systems for a lot of years, and they have an amazing number of options for how you can present the screen. But sometimes that just doesn't work, for instance, if you're totally blind. So this is where we get to screen readers. Now, a screen reader is not just a TTS engine. It's not just read everything on the screen. I remember one of the first Microsoft enhancements that was just horrible because it would read literally everything. The screen reader actually parses the view and tries to present it in a way that has some kind of logical form to it so that you can move through it and find the parts of it that you need. Now, HTML is you know, parsable but not very expressive. So the uh, Web Accessibility Initiative has created the Accessible Rich Internet Applications Standard, which includes a large number of additional tagging options so that you can mark up either a web page or more and more often a mobile application in a way that a screen reader can interpret it sensibly. And you can move through it semantically. So I work with these screen readers on a fairly regular basis. The embedded ones, uh, VoiceOver and TalkBack, VoiceOver are both iOS and uh, Mac OS X, and TalkBack on Android, uh, have very high integration with the operating system, and so they just work with everything. Now, the problem is that sometimes they don't work as well as you'd like, and that's kind of what you have now. But um, yeah, I find it a lot more effective than the standalone applications, which are the uh, open source NVDA and the very expensive JAWS. Um, and in the middle, we have ChromeVox on the Chrome browser. Anything that runs in, in the Chrome browser can use ChromeVox. But anything that doesn't run in the Chrome browser can't use ChromeVox, including one of our new applications, which really drives me a little nuts. Um, so the thing with screen readers on the desktop is you still need some way to navigate through this document that's been created for you. Now there are people who uh, use various tools with a mouse, but it's very rare. So most people are going to navigate through the screen using the tab and using special key combinations. Now tab specifically moves from actionable control to control. And this really is what we expect on a web page in any event. But it's much more carefully structured in a screen reader because it's not just about, gee, I want to get down there fast. It's about, I want to have the semantics of this expressed to me. There are almost always finer grained abilities to navigate the document object model of the screen, which includes the ARIA extensions that I talked about, so that if the screen just has not been uh, cut down enough for one to be able to get to the element that the person wants. This is the finer grained option. Also, screen readers quite often have what they call granularity control. If you want it read line by line, word by word, letter by letter, these are choices. So, I decided I'm going to do voiceover because voiceover. Uh, just does not work well with, uh, with the slide presentation. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, but I think I've explained it. Uh, it's a fairly easy concept. But what I want to show you is screen readers on mobile. 
this is obviously a much more challenging problem because look mono keys mm -hmm. there's nothing here that distinguishes this how do I get around well screen readers on mobile devices follow two different modes one is linear navigation which is based on a very simple principle your focus starts in the upper left hand corner and you swipe right to move across and down. You swipe left to move across and down. Now this is usually the way that people first approach applications using a screen reader on mobile. After they get to know the application a little bit better, they've got some muscle memory, they quite often use touch navigation. So you just know where to find things and actually the way that the screen readers are constructed it's a fairly safe exploration. I'll demonstrate. Oh yeah, there's the send button. 
course, send button is not activated, so it doesn't say anything. <coughs> Here's one of my favorite gestures, which is shut up. <laughs> Gee, I just came down. So there are people who really need more help, and so there are electronic devices available for people who want to read and write in Braille. Now these are pretty astounding little gadgets because if you're familiar with Braille, it's raised dots on a piece of paper. So we electromechanically, or using a piezoelectric device, generate the dots dynamically. So you see that this particular device here, this is, this is actually very small, it's about a foot wide. So it's something that you can put in a briefcase and take with you. It's Bluetooth connected to your device. The buttons at the top are how the user encodes outgoing text. And people get very fast with these. Now, the downside is, this is a $2,000 gadget. It's on sale. And this is one of the cheaper ones. The one next to it on the page was $7,500. So this becomes an issue of a tension between physical accessibility and structural accessibility. Can you afford it? So I was just talking with a couple people uh, before we started about voice recognition. I know there are a number of projects that uh, are underway to try to help people use uh, speech to text to control mobile devices much better. Um, we still have some of the same old problems to overcome. One that I hadn't uh, thought about was mentioned by one of you. Um, the idea that rather than having speaker independent uh, voice recognition, you have speaker dependent voice recognition that excludes other speakers. So that I can't pick up your phone and pretend I'm you. I can't lean over and say, delete file because it will ignore me. So I know that uh, a lot of the people I know with low vision or no vision do make extensive use of the ability to dictate into the phone. Um, actually, I use it when I'm driving. Sometimes I want to bring, it, bring up Google Maps, and I'll just hit that little uh, microphone icon, and I'll say, Google Kirkland. And it comes up and shows me how long I had to go to Google Kirkland, and then I start to cry. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a lot of information. What do we do with it? And actually, this is fairly compact. So, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. The fact that we have to do it as QA engineers is kind of sad because I really think that the developers should be doing this as unit tests. And in fact, one of the other things I'm pushing with Get Hangouts is working with the designers, working with the UX people, so the designs that go to the developers don't have these bugs in them. But when the developer decides, I'm going to do this, it's nice if they have this knowledge too. And it's funny that the ones who have taken it up have actually become really effective at writing more accessible code. So very simple, use your eyes. If you're normally able, you can still see something that has poor contrast or the font is so tiny you have to squint. Think about somebody for whom squinting doesn't really even help. Use your ears. Now actually, I rarely turn on the sound on my laptop because I'll follow some link and all of a sudden, here's this loud voice telling me how to get a free bra. <laughs> yeah, you gotta love the internet. Um, so this is really helpful, I talked about hitting a button and not being sure if anything happened. Quite often then I'll just turn on the volume and if I hear a sound, then I think, okay, they've given me something. But it's not enough because if I can't hear that sound, I have no clue what's happening. Use your fingers. Put your mouse aside. See if you can get to everything you want to do with just the keyboard. And by the way, um, one of the things that I really don't like about the Windows screen readers is that you end up doing 
these sort of very bizarre manipulations with your fingers to get four and five key combinations for various gestures. One of the other pieces of low-hanging fruit that I recommend is what I call the thumb test. I go at a user interface with my thumb, and if I can't run everything on the screen, if I can't select everything with my thumb, it's a bug. Seattle, one. <laughs> <laughs> 721 One of the downsides of the screen. I'm sorry, I just want to shut this thing up. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, turn on the screen reader. As I've shown you, it's not very hard to use it for basic testing. Swipe left, swipe right, swipe left. Use the navigation keys to work through <coughs> a desktop application. <coughs> I cannot believe the number of times that I hit the tab key, focus visually moves to the next element, which is a button, and I hear the very helpful information, button. <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes it's more subtle. Edit box, ready to edit. What? What am I doing here? And sometimes <clears throat> you hit the tab, and it just goes nowhere. You don't hear anything. And you're standing in the middle of a very dark room and you're completely lost. So these are simple. These are simple tests. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of navigation. <coughs> Close your eyes. Can you see where you are? Now, one of the things that, that <coughs> excuse me, a lot of people will do with these uh, seminars about accessibility is they'll have everybody wear a blindfold or something like that. That's, that's actually not very helpful. I believe that normally able QA engineers are capable of making important contributions to accessibility because we can match the visual presentation, which pretty much by the nature of numbers is going to be the primary presentation that the developers are creating. We can match that against what we can hear through a screen reader, what we can see through tools that allow us to, to emulate what it is to be colorblind. We have the ability to contribute even though we ourselves are not customers. So I've named a few resources here, and I know the slide deck is going to be available uh, for what it's worth. Um, the one tool that I want to recommend very highly is called C. Um, it is by a company called Q42. They made it for free just because it's a great thing in the world. And it allows you to simulate a large number of visual impairments, including progressive impairments such as diabetic retinopathy. You can actually do a slider and see how it gets worse over time. But it's especially helpful for uh, checking on whether or not colorblind people are going to be able to make use of this tool. Uh, for more advanced analysis, Color Contrast Analyzer is an online tool <coughs> that allows you to pull out, even if you can't see the code, if you can't get into the, the hex codes for the colors, which I can't because Google is paranoid, um, you can actually pull those colors off the screen and you can analyze them for contrast ratio. So just to wrap up, accessible design is a matter of law. Um, there are potentially, I've not heard of it yet, there are potentially fines and penalties for people who do not create accessible software. Uh, accessible design is clearly a matter of social justice. Uh, I just can't press that strongly enough. This is about equal access. This is about not creating a new digital divide. Not based on the haves and the have-nots, but the cans and the cans. Frankly, accessible design should not be rocket science. If it is difficult for a disabled person, you know something? A lot of times it sucks for the normally able, too. 
when I go into an application and here's this really complex menu structure or something like that, and I need to go five menus deep to change something simple, I want to go find the developer and beat him. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine how much worse it is when you are going into those menus through the linear, serialized experience of a screen reader. So it's really about design for everyone. So like I said to that developer, there is no numerical coefficient for social justice. And I've always loved this Jerry Garcia quote. Somebody has to do something, and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. They should have caught this stuff before they wrote the first line of code. So I want to thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. So I've always been a key, I mean, I can use a mouse, of course, but I've always liked using tab and using the keyboard. And I, in my years of testing, I have seen companies get away from uh, keyboard accessibility. Is that changing? Is Not it more accessible now with the keyboard than it used to be? At Google, I do see that. Okay. Now, Google does have, or at least this is a state they have, a corporate commitment to accessibility. And I've heard this from Vint Cerf, who I've known since the ITF days. Um, other companies kind of get it because they don't want to lose customers. And then, as I mentioned, with CVAA, some companies have to get it because otherwise the FCC is going to come uh, you know, slap them on the wrists. But, but why? I mean, people have a choice of what to buy. It's like a game. If I don't like the game, or I don't like how the game is played, I just don't play it. Well, the problem is that especially in, in some types of software, you may be limited in choice. Mm -hmm. And again, this is an issue of social justice. And rather than artificially constraining your choice mm -hmm. based on the fact that you can't see, or you have motor skill disabilities, or whatever your disability might be, We've chosen as a matter of public policy to say that's not okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add to that. It's also, um, you may have a choice in your personal life, but you won't <coughs> have a choice if you join an enterprise environment. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's really, really important when a company decides to purchase something, they make sure that the product that they're purchasing is fully accessible mm -hmm. in case any of their employees have this good. That's a very great point. Yeah, that's a very good point. <coughs> and unfortunately, some companies really don't have the expertise. I mean, to me at this point, it's kind of a no-brainer. I hope that I've made it seem very uh, easy to grasp to you. But I talk to people all the time who just look at me blankly when I talk about screen readers or when I talk about not being able to use the mouse. I went to a meeting with a program manager one time to explain to him why his product had a problem. And one of the things I learned was that you could set a Mac so that you plug in a mouse and the touchpad doesn't work. So I put the mouse in a bag, I plugged it in, I handed him the laptop and said, show me how your product works with just the keyboard. I didn't want him to just go to the, he kept trying to go to the touchpad mm -hmm. and it didn't work. And he said, how do I do this? I said, that's my point. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, you mentioned the scenario where you're driving and you use you use your your uh, speech recognition to bring up you know the maps and whatnot. Um, so that touches on the point of uh, situational disability. So uh, in that situation, uh, you need to use tools that someone may need to use all the time. Um, have you had any success in Google talking about that situational disability universal design perspective? There's some discussion. Because <laughs> I want to respect the time where I work. Uh, let me just say that this, we're not that far down the path. We just started doing user studies. And I've been wanting to do user studies since I got there a year ago. 
uh, I've trained in research design. I said, look, I can just do this. We can. Just did the first one about two months ago. We found three really great bugs that I didn't know about because I didn't use the product that way. I didn't really use the assistive technologies. I test them. So there's no substitute for finding out what your users think. But I completely agree with you. There are people who are having those conversations. They're still kind of over in the research area and the people who are actually building products and shipping products, and managing those people are uh, still kind of trying to get the basic ideas of uh, just functional accessibility. Yes? So um, you present, and I think it's a reasonable proposition that this is kind of a no-brainer once, you, once, you're, once you're handed it in the right form and you see it and you experience it, whether, whether you use a blindfold or, or, or so, however you do to get the point across to somebody. Um, but of course, Development's a high turnover environment. There's always people coming out of school, and, and those are usually the most able people, mm -hmm. right? So they're, you know, they're 22, their eyes still work, <laughs> their knees still work. Um, I have never seen a white cane at Google Carpet. So, yeah. Um, how do you, how, do you have thoughts or experience about how to, how to instill this from sort of a cultural standpoint? So when you assimilate new people into the environment, that they get this a little sooner than the ones before it, and hopefully down the road it becomes easier. They come in, or maybe not knowing it right away, but they, they sort of are the sixth monkey, if you're familiar with the, the, the monkeys and bananas, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that they get it culturally rather than having to sort of be hit in the face with it to, to get it. That's an uphill battle. And yes, Google does have lot of new people coming in all the time. And one of the things I found useful is essentially to let the managers pass the pain down. Uh, the engineering manager was really unhappy with me that there were these accessibility bugs that were required to be fixed before we could ship the product. And I said, so one thing, I didn't make that rule. Android made that rule. For another thing, I didn't write those bugs. Your people did. I found them. And I've noticed that his organization has come to me with more questions lately. <laughs> People actually are trying to understand this because they don't want the engineering manager looking at, okay, who's this assigned to? All right, you wrote this, thousand white lashes. Um, what I want to do actually, and this is as I proceed more into academia after I'm done with my dissertation, is I want to work at getting this into computer science programs. So I take a socio-technical approach to the computer information system. And I want to work with computer science departments, computer science curriculum, so that we actually teach people some history, some ethics. We give them a sense of tradition. You get this in other forms of engineering, but software engineering is so new yeah. that we, we just haven't done that yet. It's not that it isn't there to be done, but we haven't done it. And so that's one of my little you know, windmills, which I intend to tilt. Mm -hmm. Because the further upstream we get, we can get people to actually wrap their heads around the idea of software that's accessible to all before they have a right alignment. That's the best. But yeah, that's, that's really the only thing I've been able to do is just make sure that I'm very visible. There's a lot of email that comes out from me, uh, and I get all the videos. Over here? Yes. Oh, I just, on that line, I, I one of the things I did, um, I built Boston Engine recently, so I was out of work for a while. Yeah. I read the book Rework, um, which is about software development, and, you know, we should do it differently. It's somewhat positive of how we should organize our software. And I wrote to the author and said, well, what about accessibility? And the best response I got was, well, you have to have someone on your team who is an advocate for accessibility. Mm -hmm. And that was the best he could do. It's like, really? I will say that over the last year, the accessibility of the Hangout suite of products has increased dramatically. It actually has. I, I can say for a fact. Well, thank you. Hmm. Um, it's, it's harder to find the bugs. The bugs are more subtle. I like that. 
because really I would rather we had bug-free software and I was just the guy that said, yep, it's bug-free, here's your rubber stamp, go forth. Um, but it does come down really to me. For an engineering team that's 150 people, it's about me being in people's faces. Well, we are past the hour by a little bit. I'm going to hang around for a little bit longer. So if you want to ask me any one-on-one -on -one questions, um, I don't bruise easily. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm graduate student. So. Thank, you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.